Welcome to EPG Patshala lecture series for MRC students. Uh, today we are doing the rise of the suburbs part two. So we talked about what happened in the suburban development in Europe and the USA. Today I am going to talk about what uh, what were the thoughts that came out of this whole new idea of living outside the city, and what happened and what what was the follow through of these uh, these. Uh, new opportunities or new constraints that the whole idea of living outside the city presented and the the it also presented a whole new opportunity of building something right from the scratch something new something different and the response is coming from the fact that it is it is uh, a response to the to two things to industrialization and also to the advent of automobile and the advent of uh, trains and trams and mass transit so it is in response to that that a whole lot of new thought came in into urban design and urban planning really and the first one that i will talk about today is uh, ebenezer howard's garden cities now if you look at this particular advertisement that appeared in the newspapers in the early 1900s it's uh, sort of showing you uh, uh, three images which is yesterday and you can see the city filled with smoke the industrial city which is represented in the first image the second image sort of shows you that you are still living close to the industrial city and you are um, living in the suburbs which is what i i ended my last uh, uh, talk with that we are still we are in the suburbs but we are not working in the suburbs we are working still in the city so we are traveling we are commuting so the, this is the whole new thought of living and working in the same place and which is sort of a more beautiful place than the city than the city um the industrial city was and this presented a whole new opportunity a whole new thought of living and working in the suburb in a place which is pristine which is clean which is green so this is uh, where the first thought sort of came in in the late 1800s was even as or the early 1900s 1902 i think so it sort of started with him who thought of uh, um you know something called garden cities wherein he said that the city could itself be a self sustaining unit it and it could be a combination of town and country so his diagram over here which is the three magnets diagram sort of became very uh, very famous and this says that this is this first magnet is town which is attracting people due to certain aspects of it in terms of providing job opportunities obviously and there is this uh, country which sort of attracts people because of its nature because a big na component of the nature component of living close to nature in green environment and then he talks about his own um, idea of a town country mix which he says it could still be a town and who bit what stops it from being in the country so this is his his thought or that people can live and work in the same place and fulfill their desire to live to close to nature and still have a good or empl employment opportunity so this is the ho a whole idea of a self sustaining township that came into uh, being at that point in time which was slightly different from what was happening in reality wherein only the living part of the um, the whole component of a city was moving out to the suburbs yes his uh, his idea of city i mean need not be really a circular city that's what this is just a notional diagram that he made but a central city and then the satellite cities and the central city has its own uh, working places in the middle and surrounded by you know living places and surrounded by a green agricultural belt wherein he says that people can grow their own uh, vegetables they grow their own food and it could be a self sustaining community and when the population exceeds a certain number i think this in this case was 30000 the satellite city is formed so this is what he said that the cities can grow in this manner now up until now nobody has really thought that how cities will grow uh, because of the invention of automobile what will change the whole idea of growth of a city so this is probably the first thought that came that how cities can expand uh, exponentially because they need to now and because of the rise in population and because of the employment opportunities so what in what way can they grow is what i think formed the basic premise of his uh, his uh, uh, thought and this thought was 
very powerful at that point in time because it was very different from what was actually happening on the ground. The first place where this was implemented was Letchworth uh, Garden City which was done by Anvin, uh, Raymond Anvin and he sort of implemented Ebenezer Howard's thought into the, into the city. The city still remains in the similar way that it was and Ebenezer Howard did not only talk about the physical aspect of the city, he was very aware of the issues uh, regarding land spe speculation and the real estate development that was happening in the city because of all these changes and because of new land pockets being available for development or being, um, what do you say, uh, financially more viable, financially uh, rather lucrative for the real estate people to sort of develop those suburbs, especially in the US. So this was uh, his idea that the whole city will be managed in a commun community socialist kind of a way. So the citizens sort of manage the city uh, and they lease out the, the land or the properties to the citizens so that they can take care of their own leased properties for a while. But then that is only for a while, nobody actually owns the land other than the citizens trust. So this is what he thought was the basic premise of all the wrongness that was happening due to all these opportunities available to the private developers and as well as to the governments. So uh, this was his thought. The other thought which was also very powerful although very uh, difficult <laughs> sort of to uh, do was uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broad Acre City which the idea of it he propounded in a book called The Disappearing City in uh, 1932. Now the idea behind Disappearing City is that the city is itself a menace, is where he comes from. He says that it is it's a tumour, in his own words, like some tumour grown malignant. The city, like a cancerous growth, has become a menace to the society. So what he says is that uh, expand the city in such a manner that everybody has an acre to live and grow their food and live harmoniously with the nature. He obviously comes from uh, you know a parairi kind of a landscape so maybe that was in back of his mind when he suggested something like broad acre city but that would need a whole lot of commute and he also thought about the commute by the way but uh, he was all for uh, decentralization. So there should be as many kinds of houses as there are kinds of people and as many differentiation as there are different individuals. A man who has individuality and what man lacks it has a right to expression in his own environment. So this is what he thought Broad Acre City would represent. It would represent democracy, it would represent uh, decentralization, it would represent something spread out far wide across the world maybe. Uh, so this is what his sketches sort of show you and he also talked about what kind of transportation will be required to sustain these cities other than the arterial roads and the railways. He suggested uh, something like an aerator, a helicopter that could land without a landing script. So this is coming from his own sketches and the famous Frank Lloyd Wright car, the automobile. So uh, as I said, monarchy was the ideal of centralization, so democracy is the ideal of reintegrated decentralization. That is the basic theme of Broad Acre City and what he thought should be done to the cities. Um, and obviously his idea of a city was very different from what exactly we ended up doing. The other thought that came up around this time was uh, the neighborhood unit of 1920s which is uh, by Clarence Perry. Uh, now this particular unit was also influenced in many ways by Garden City's concept and uh, it talks about uh, it talks about what kind of size should a neighborhood unit have and if at all and it also is a self-sustaining unit and all of these are self-sustaining units they are really not just suburbs. So he, he talks about institutions and community centers at the center of the city, center of the neighborhood and he talks about uh, schools as, as the basic idea of deciding the size of the neighborhood. So whatever uh, uh, size of population the school can sustain, the neighborhood should be, should be that big. And somehow he also comes at a magical number of 30,000. And uh, the shops and uh, everything else that is related to the community is placed on the outskirts of the peripheral arterial road. There is no traffic inside the neighborhood unit other than the people who are coming to the neighborhood unit. So there is no thorough traffic that only happens at the arterial roads that are adjoining 
the, the arterial roads this ones that are joining the neighborhood unit, the institutions at the center and the, uh, the shopping at the periphery which can be shared by the next neighborhood unit is what the whole idea of, uh, of um, um, neighborhood unit was by Clarence Perry. He also talks about, about uh, having a grid iron pattern vis-a-vis -vis having a more organic uh, approach to designing the neighborhood and he sort of comes up with a solution that the grid iron may not just be the ideal situation even to utilize the land in fullest manner. He showed through his diagrams, through his, uh, through his approaches that uh, organic patterns can very well respond to high densities or to densities that were required to sustain that kind of neighborhood that he was talking about. The next uh, very significant thought and what thought is in, uh, what was very, very important at that point in time was, uh, was the Radiant City by Lee Corbusier. Now, uh, Lee Corbusier was, uh, was very influenced in the beginning by socialist cities and he designed Radiant City as an image of the, uh, firstly he designed the city, contemporary city, which was an image of a rad, uh, uh, linear city. And then Radiant City sort of emerged from the contemporary city and it also has in the center, uh, you know, the living blocks which were sort of uh, um, uh, placed here, the industry at the bottom and the administration at the top and he imagined the human being uh, as the basic idea of how a city should be. So, the arm, the head represents the administration, the body represents the places to live and the lower part represents the industry. So, this is, this was his idea of how the cities would be, but it was very different from the other two that we have seen before because he talks about high rise development. He talks about towers which were really, really high. So, if you look at the previous slide where he says, um, the uniformity of the units that compose the picture throw into relief the firm lines on which the far flung masses are constructed, their outlines soften by distance, the skyscrapers and he is talking about really, really going high rise, uh, raise immense geometrical facades all of glass and th in them reflected the blue glory of sky and this is probably why he called it radiant city. Um, so, this is a very famous uh, diagram or sketch by him which shows the concept, the idea that he had in mind which is, uh, which is the towers in the park. So, this is, this is essentially if you look at it, this is what we have ended up doing in most places. We are going high rise and we are putting people, uh, you know, high densities and leaving the ground uh, empty for the open spaces and it's a very powerful image and it sort of conveys and sort of shows what, uh, what we have ended up doing in terms of our suburb suburban developments in most cases. Um, he also talked about the, commun the commute and he talked about the above ground roads, the on ground roads and the below ground roads and uh, the, the arterial roads which will carry very, very fast moving traffic and the roads on the ground which will carry the traffic which will uh, cater to that particular neighborhood or that particular place. And this is the kind of transportation networks he talks about which are on different, different levels. And this line from him, this quote from him probably sums up what he wanted in terms of how the cities should expand is that cities will be part of the country. He is also talking about cities being part of the country like very, very, very much like what Frank Lloyd Wright did, but his is a very different vision. He's talking about high density towers, whereas Frank Lloyd Wright ta talks about it all being spread out on the ground. So, I shall live 30 miles from my office in one direction under a pine tree and my secretary will live 30 miles away from it too. In the other direction, under, under another pine tree, we shall both have out our own car. We shall use up tires, wear out road surfaces and gears and consume oil and gasoline, all of which will be necessitate a great deal of work, enough for all. Now, obviously, at that point in time, they had no fear of the fossil fuels sort of ending. <laughs> so, maybe that is why he did it, but this is, uh, this is what his thought was, that it will all be spread out in the country, it will all um, in form of high rise towers, in form of open ground and in form of, you know, uh, towers being supported on the pillars and everything will be left at the ground emptied for people to sort of use it. 
So, this was his vision of how an ideal city should be because people are trying to sort of invent what cities should look like. In the meanwhile, while we are all, I mean, we are seeing these pastoral imaginations at some point, what's happening is at, on ground, uh, people are trying to find their houses in suburbs. And as I mentioned before in the previous lecture, uh, the Americans, uh, mostly the white Americans, are moving out from the city centers. And it is, some of it is high class and some of it is middle class. And especially uh, what, what the builders did at that point in time, they sold that dream of living in a suburb to a, to a middle class family in a big, big way. And the government supported it in terms of uh, offering cheaper mortgages and removing the redlining and uh, just offering opportunities for people to move out from the city centers. And this is, these are next few slides are a few examples of what the advertisements look like of uh, you know banks offering cheaper mortgages and the real estate um, developers offering beautiful homes and then <laughs> this particular advertisement for example shows uh, what uh, what women doesn't yearn for her own gardens and flowers so it's sort of targeted towards the women who are you know looking for a green space of their own and the next one is targeted towards the man his castle home owning breeds real men so you see these kind of advertisements coming in the newspaper which were portraying a dream of living in the suburbs and living uh, a good life in the suburbs and this is what suburbs did to America in, in a big way. It promoted that whole idea of uh, living outside of the city and living in green environment and clean environment and all of that. Uh, this is another advertisement which was showing how your family expenses could be balanced if you are living in the suburbs in your own home. Um, owned home makes life more worthwhile in every way. <laughs> and the um, Truman Show was shot in Riverside which was which, which is probably the epitome of what a new suburb would look like and then it is designed in that way in, as a as a result of the industrial suburb and if you look at if you see in the movie you'll realize that the life is quite monotonous over there there is not much up and down there's no traffic to crib about so all of it is part of the suburban life all of it is part of the dream that the developers and the banks showed to the people and asked them to become part of and at the same time what's happening in the Britain is also a shift towards uh, moving out to the suburbs the properties within the cities still remain expensive uh, if, and the people who have ancestral properties really didn't want to move out too much but then um, Raymond Unwin was uh, influenced obviously by Ebenezer Howard had his own idea of how a suburb could be designed and uh, he came up with this pamphlet called Nothing Gained by Overcrowding, wherein he shows that even if you have green spaces, uh, very much like what uh, what neighborhood unit did, even if you have green space, you need not be monotonous in designing your communities. You could have green spaces in the middle, you can play around with the plants and still have uh, reasonable densities to sort of make it financially viable. And uh, uh, slowly as, as uh, time went on, people uh, from the England, uh, sorry, uh, from London, middle town, they also, the middle class especially, started to look out for, uh, for places to live. And then if they can own a home at say 675 pounds or 825 pounds or say for example in the court it says 495 pounds, they were willing to go out. They were willing to move out and they were willing to live in a place which was probably worth living and safer for their kids to sort of grow up. So middle class decided that they will move out and they sort of moved out. And uh, while all this is happening, there is also a very, uh, a very strong phenomenon that emerged out of this whole thing of the white people moving out, especially in the United States, it's called the white flight wherein uh, the white people moved out from the city centers and the black people remained there because they had obviously no means, uh, they still were poorest of the poor. So they remained there and the white people were moving out to the suburbs and that sort of because uh, the government also supported in a way the white communities uh, to sort of provide loans to them so that they can have an upward mobility in terms of housing but they were not doing so for the blacks. 
So, they still remained in the city center fighting for their uh, you know day to day living and the whites were able to sort of move out and um, convert into a middle class actually a lower middle class and then a middle class. Uh, the a couple of pictures over here actually show you what, what sort of uh, you know uh, transition that happened if you see that in towards the right is world's highest standard of living and you see a bus driven by the white people and by, whereas the black people are sort of herded out from there and you see the suburban development and how that is represented in the in the diagram which is sort of very very uh, common of what it was at that point in time and this led to obviously racial segregation and this led to a, as I mentioned middle class exodus and uh, there were techs and centers for the industries to set themselves up in suburbs. So, they were industrial suburbs as well, they were people who were uh, now working and living both in suburbs and there was cheap land and they because of the movement of the middle class there was cheap labor as well and bank loans as I mentioned they were favoring whites still and that sort of led to a very highly discriminated society and there were there were things like uh, the poster on the on the left side we want white tenants in our white community so this kind of racial uh, segregation also happened very widely because of all these policies and because of all what happened uh, through this time and on such a large scale of middle class uh, exodus or middle class migration to the suburbs what also happens is that some of the buildings are left behind and they were unused and also lead to the blighting uh, of the of those you know areas also leads to urban blight. Uh, one of the examples of urban blight that we can see is the Michigan Central Station in uh, in Detroit and it sort of uh, was a very visible example of uh, of its decline because it was completely put to um, went into a state of disuse after the after the white flight happened and this was unused for a while until it was closed in 1988 completely. It also led to ghettoization and one of the ve very uh, important or famous ghettos is in Bronx. Obviously, the area has now revived itself, but then the Bronx ghettos existed for a very long time because of obviously people moving out and the, uh, the blacks moving in and all of the crimes and the similar situations what happened in tenements also existed in the ghettos. Um, I will quickly talk about some of the suburbanization, suburbanisms that happened following these few things that I have discussed in this particular talk before, the Ebenezer Howard city and Broadacre and the Radium city and the neighborhood you know. So, what exactly followed that or uh, there is a hazy timeline uh, of all these events, they are all happening simultaneously as well as not happening simultaneously. So, uh, Ragburn is one of the uh, uh, significant examples of what happened to a suburb which was designed in a manner which was very different. It, they had cul-de-sacs and they had entrances from the gardens from the back sides and the cul-de-sacs somehow developed into zones of uh, unwanted activities and there was a little bit of a problem over there. But then this was a completely new experiment in terms of uh, designing a suburb. And if you look at the uh, advertisement, advertisements that came up for the Redburn suburb was also the town for the motor age and safe for the children and you know so basically a good life is what they were offering and the picture on the right actually shows you what kind of uh, you know houses and uh, streets there were. Now this was uh, this was designed by Raymond Downwind. this is a uh, garden suburb at Hampstead, North London. Now, in in uh, London, if you remember from the last talk, we talked about uh, a movement from uh, a normal uh, row housing kind of a development for a worker suburb to a more organic development, which was more in line with the whole idea of Garden City or the City Beautiful. Uh, this was designed by Raymond Nunwin uh, and it was designed to be in more in tradition with that. So, you can see the difference in terms of planning and it is not really just row housing or it is sort of an organic thing happening all over uh, the place very, very organically. Uh, this is uh, this is the picture of the garden suburb central square and designed by Edwin Lutins. A lot of famous architects were involved over there in designing the buildings as well. 
and on the right side is a plan of the central um, garden suburb, central garden of the Hampstead suburb. Now, another uh, result, another type of uh, development that came through af especially after the world war, but there was a need to sort of uh, provide cheaper housing for the people who are returning from the war, from the, for the warriors, for the soldiers. Uh, and Levitt Town was a response to one of those uh, requirements and it was built by the Levitt brothers, 1947 to 1951. And if you look at the image, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is, is probably that it is monotonous, it is sort of you know, same everywhere and there is sort of no difference in what, uh, what a house is at one street to the other. But Levitt Town, um, although very, very uh, controversial in terms of its uh, planning approach, in terms of its design approach, but it served that purpose of providing cheap housing to the people at that point in time and it was probably required and Levitt Town, uh, Levitt Brothers made it in, in different pockets of uh, US and they were quite successful in terms of occupancies, people did flock to their, uh, their colonies. So, this is, these were a few of the advertisements and few of the newspaper clippings that came around that time when Le Levitt Town was launched and uh, you can see how, how the life would be at Levitt Town which is uh, I feel quite, quite nice if you look at it. And Levitt uh, plans low priced homes suitable for any wage earner which was also the main selling point for Levitt Town that you had homes of all varieties of all uh, you know all types wherein you can come and actually be a part of that whole community and it was uh, it was um, as i said controversial but it also served the need of the art for that particular time and there were also other suburbanisms like this one this is uh, this is a company town called bonville it was designed for for bonville and it had all the components that needed to sustain itself as a self-sustaining unit. Uh, it has the industry, it has the schools, community and everything else. So, it is, it is a self-sustaining uh, uh, place. Um, this was uh, uh, one of the earlier thoughts of a socialist, uh, socialist city um, by Soria Vaimata and it sort of talks about how, how the houses should be placed in, uh, in a single line which are approachable in the similar way from the access routes and uh, uh, it's it's in a way it was quite influential at that point in time when uh, the socialist idea of a city was emerging in terms of how uh, how the socialism could be represented in form of a neighborhood development in form of a physical manifestation of the idea of uh, equality of the uh, of the access so, this was the one of the early thoughts that came up as part of the idea of socialist cities. Um, another uh, idea that we could talk about here is, uh, is the um, Une Cité Industrielle by Tony Garnier, who sort of uh, designed the whole idea of an industrial city himself and he said that this is how an industrial city should be, wherein industry is the center of everything. Not the church which, which is what he saw in the medieval cities or the cities of the past, like not the church, not the citadel, not the palace, but the industry because that has become the central of all the economic activity now and which was a very significant change in terms of the thought about the city at that point in time because coming from the medieval background, it was hard to imagine that a church, a citadel or a palace would not be the center of the city, but an industry would be. So, it was quite an interesting thought at that point when he brought it about and it was talking about equality as well. Uh, so, what did the suburban life look like is what uh, has been debate, a topic for debate for a really long time. Uh, suburban life sort of uh, um, imbibed that whole idea of living in a single family home and if you look at the picture on the left, it sort of shows you what a single family would have looked like, which is very contrasting to the single family that I showed you in the first uh, talk, which is uh, you know comprising of eight children and living in a slum. So, but this is what the uh, with what the single family of a suburb would look like. Okay, 
and if you've seen the movie which is the poster of which is on the right home alone you would figure out what it would be like to live in a suburb which is uh, people do know their neighbors but uh, they are sort of you know alone in their own homes so this whole idea of uh, of a single family of not living in a uh, in a large family sort of was uh, promulgated over here in suburbs the other thing that happened because of uh, in, you know the large scale demand for housing which shifted to, towards the suburb is the need for constructing them really fast and at a pace which was unprecedented in terms of construction the industrial revolution the parts manufacturing actually helped and uh, you would see these balloon framed houses which were really fast to construct within 7 or 8 days you could be ready with a house uh, also happened within uh, you know because of the need of housing a fast uh, you know uh, requirement of filling up the um, or making the houses really fast and of course they were mass produced the parts of it were very very similar so if you would see at the see the windows they'll all be the same so yes they were mass produced they were produced uh, they were the houses for the first time probably were produced in factories at least the parts of it and they were only assembled and they were brought in and then assembled into houses it was all made possible through certain other developments in terms of uh, the literature being available to the carpenters to the people who can build their own homes so a whole lot of pattern books what we call as pattern books came along at that point in time wherein you can actually refer to them and sort of buy an edwardian window and come back and install it in your own house it's just possible because those parts were available so just choose your part and build your own house or just hire a carpenter to do that so the all of this uh, sort of led to a mass uh, produced sort of uh, image for suburbs and it has been controversial uh, in terms of whether it should have been like this or it could have been a little different but this is what we got when we talk about suburban life uh, so suburbanization was a direct result of population growth housing shortage mortgage structures uh, conscious government policies of how we should proceed in terms of growing our cities and invention definitely of the automobile now responses to all these policies the shortage the growth and the automobile has been slightly different in different parts of the world but they are all interlinked with each other one influencing the other the other influencing the first and while the responses have been different one thing remains constant that the invention of the automobile has changed the way our cities have been forever and in more days ways than one and the next talk that i will be doing will be about how the automobile has changed uh, the way we live and what can be the impact in the future so i will be talking about certain new ideas that have come up and uh, how we have dealt with automobile and urban ecology and our own uh, sort of ecology and the environment and how can we deal with it we, because we are still struggling with that so i will be talking about that in my next presentation thank you for now